Welcome back to chapter 14. In this chapter, we are going to look more at probability and expand on those rules that we saw in the last chapter. The last chapter had the very basic rules. This chapter, we're going to get more. We're going to get some more conditional probability and things like that. So last chapter, we saw the general addition rule, um, and that's when your two events are disjoint which means they have no overlap, uh, we can find the probability of both events happening or of either event happening by adding. Um, the probability of both events happening is zero since they have no overlap. But the probability of either event happening, um, we just add the two probabilities together. But there's times when they're not disjoint. So for that, we need the general addition rule. And the general addition rule comes from this, we can see it from the Venn diagram. This is where we have some overlap. If we take the probability of A and add it to the probability of B, we've added this middle area twice. And so we have to subtract that off again. So for any two events, we get the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap because we've added that twice. Um, we can do it for three events too. That's not not covered here so much, um, but it, you have an extra Venn diagram and or an extra circle in your Venn diagram. And you can see how you you add the things multiple times and subtract them, and it's it's kind of crazy. Um, so the general addition rule is this, for the disjoint events, this probability here at the end, the probability of A and B is zero because there's no overlap. So that's just a, spe uh, a special case of this rule. Um, so back in chapter three, we looked at the contingency tables and talked about the conditional distributions. Um, these were the two-way tables. We saw um, just various probabilities. And we're going to look at that again um, this chapter. And these are called conditional distributions or conditional probabilities. Uh, when we write them, we write them just like this. We have P of B, then a line, then A. That's the probability of B given A. It's a probability of B given that we know that A already happened. So um, that does not have to be a sequential thing. We could have the probability of rolling one dice and getting a six given that we know it's an even number. Well, there's one six out of three even numbers, so it'd be one third. Um, and that's again just called conditional probability. Sometimes it's the pr sometimes it is sequential. Um, Something one happens, and then all right. So what's the probability of thing B now? Thing one happened, um, but a lot of times it's just given that we know some information. You know, what's the probability of the uh, chapter three? We were looking at the Titanic. Uh, what's the probability that they survived, given that they were in first class? We know they're in first class. So we only had to look at the first class row. And this is the same, it's no different. We just have a little bit more notation, stuff like that. Um, so to find the probability of event given A, um, we restrict the total. And that's just what I had said. We had um, the probability of six given that we know it's even. There's one six, uh, probability of six given even. It's one six out of three even dice. The probability of them surviving on the Titanic, given that they were in first class, it would be how many people from first class survived, divided by the number of people in first class. We don't care about the rest of them, just like the makers of the Titanic. Um, but for our probability, we do care about the rest of them. But for the probability's sake in this question, um, it's only that first class passenger number that matters. Um, and we know that P of A can't equal zero because it's already happened. Um, so that's, that's not an issue. Um, 
the multiplication rule, the general multiplication rule. Last chapter, we saw that if A and B are independent, then we can get the probability of both by simply multiplying them. However, if they are not independent, we need the general multiplication rule, um, which is, um, it involves conditional probability. The probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. And we could extend this to the probability of A and B and C is the probability of A times the probability of B given A times the probability of C given A and B. Um, the formulas look kind of complicated, but the actual the actual idea is not. Um, for example, let's say we're drawing marbles from a bag. And let's just say we have three red and four blue. We want the probability of drawing two red marbles. So we're gonna have a red and Come on, pen, and a red. So the first one, what's the probability, probability of drawing a red? Well, there's three reds out of seven total marbles. Then times, now we're assuming that we're not putting it back in the bag. That would be without or with replacement. We're looking at it without replacement. We're holding on to this red marble. Um, we'll talk about replacement in just a minute, but we're holding on to a red marble, so now what's the probability of the next marble being red given that we have a red marble in the hand? Well, there's no longer three red marbles in the bag. There's now only two out of six total marbles. That is the probability of B given A. What if we wanted the third red marble? Well, now there's only one red marble out of five total marbles, so we'd multiply that to it. Um, we could do the same idea with, say, cards. What's the probability of getting two aces? Well, the first ace, there's four out of 52 total cards. I know that you can reduce that, but we're just looking at the totals here. And then the second one, so now, assuming that we have an ace in our hand, there are three aces left in the deck out of 51 cards. The next one, if we wanted three aces, there'd be two out of 50 cards. And if we wanted four aces, then that would be one out of 49 cards. So you can keep going with this conditional probability. Like it doesn't have to be a complicated thing. And a lot of times it's not. If you're just looking at the situation kind of like logically and consecutively. Um, so the independence means that the outcome of one does not influence the probability of another um, with this new um, equation we can tell if things are independent if the probability of B given a equals the probability of B then a and B are independent and it works out the same the other way as well so if the conditional probability equals the regular probability, it means they're independent. Also, they're independent if probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. That's another definition for them to be independent. Now, um, we have to be careful because a lot of times when people take probabilities, they just want to multiply the two. They don't think about the conditional probability and it has to be independent in order for this to work. And we'll see that again here in a second. Um, so independent does not mean the same thing as disjoint. We mentioned this last chapter and I'm going to mention it again several times because this is a huge thing. They're always taught at the same time because they relate to each other, but they are not the same thing. Um, in fact, disjoint events cannot be independent. If they're disjoint, it means there's zero overlap. It means 
the probability of A and B equals zero. Well, you're not going to multiply two non-zero numbers together and get zero. If they are disjoint, they cannot be independent because if one happens, it means the other one cannot happen. It affects that probability. Um, and so um, they cannot be independent. And same thing, independent events cannot be disjoint. Um, and so common error here is to take disjoint events and try to multiply their probabilities together. You cannot do that. You can add them. You cannot multiply them to get an intersection. You can add them to get a union. You can add them to get or. We want one or two. You cannot multiply them to get one and two. Um, and so, once again, disjoint events are separate in that they um, can't occur together. Independent events are separate, meaning that the probability of one does not, or the outcome of one does not affect the probability of the other. Um, and once again, disjoint and independent events do not mean the same thing. It may sound like I'm repeating myself because I am, but this is a big thing that people mix up. And so I just want to make sure that you're like, don't be that guy, basically. Just so what of you is going to mix up independent and disjoint. You just don't want to be that guy. Let someone else be that guy. Um, so depending on independence, I love the title of this one. Depending on independence. Um, a lot of times, like we like to think of things as independent. And in fact, for most of the year, independence is going to be a requirement to do the stuff that we're going to do. When we get samples, they need to be independent samples. Um, however, when we're working with probability, it's not something. So it's not always independent. Um, so don't just multiply them. You have to be thinking about conditional probabilities. Don't assume that they're independent. Um, and like, don't fall into the trap. Whenever you see the probabilities multiplied together, ask to see, are they independent or not? Um, so this is the, the, the idea of replacement. So we were talking about drawing the marble or drawing the card uh, a few minutes ago. Um, so sampling without replacement means that when we draw it, we don't put it back. This happens a lot. Like when you're playing cards, you get a few cards in your hand. So do the other people. You're not putting them back into the deck. So every time a card is dealt, it changes the probability of that deck. Um, and there's lots of things where you don't put stuff back. Um, there are some things that you do. Now, if we have a huge population, it doesn't matter too much. I mean, if we're taking um, people of the state of Washington, we need to gather like 50 people. The state of Washington has so many people that when you pull those 50 people out, it's not going to change the probability of each individual. Um, it's not going to change it significantly enough to worry about. But a lot of times we're not dealing with a population that big. Um, and so when we have a small population, we have to adjust those probabilities, as I mentioned with the marbles and the cards. Um, and so uh, without replacement gives us conditional probabilities. With replacement means that when we draw it, we look at it, we stick it back. The deck has the same probability now. So the probability hasn't changed, it's independent. Um, so tree diagrams. We saw tree diagrams a little bit, um, but they can really, really, really help us work through conditional probability problems. Um, and that's just part of the make a picture thing. Uh, some probability problems a tree diagram is honestly the difference between success and failure. You could use Bayes' formula or Bayes' rule, um, but that is 
really long and complicated and you really don't want to use that. Making tree diagram actually does the exact same thing, um, but it's in a much more logical sense. So, for example, here's a tree diagram. Um, we had accidents. So you had an accident, 77% of people wear a seatbelt, 23% don't. Um, and then of the people wearing a seatbelt, 8% are injured, 92% are okay. Not wearing a seatbelt, 37 are injured, and 63 are okay. And what that does is it breaks it into these um, discrete topics. So we can actually add these together. They're mutually exclusive. Um, if we add them together, we get one. That's not the wonderful thing about this though. The wonderful thing about this and where we get to Bayes' rules where we reverse the probabilities. So on the next slide, we'll see an example, or not an example, an equation. Um, but here we get the probabilities of like, if you're wearing a seatbelt, we have the probability that you get injured or you don't. What if we got injured and we wanted to know if we're injured, what's the probability we were wearing a seatbelt? So we'd be looking for the probability of seatbelt given that we're injured. And so for that, it's going to be the, the union of them or the intersection of them. It's going to be that one, 0 0.0616 divided by the probability that someone was injured. Well, that's that one and this one because they were injured on both of those. So we'd have to add these two together. So 0 0.0616 plus 0 0.0851. So what's the probability that you were wearing a seatbelt given that you were injured? And then and this is this equation right here that we wrote is actually Bayes' rule. It's just with the um, with the symbols and stuff it gets pretty complex, uh, complex looking. Six one six. I'm doing the calculation here. Point zero eight five one. Is that and then point zero. And so we get uh, 42%, like 0.4199. So that tells us that people were wearing a seatbelt 42% uh, of the time um, when they got injured in a car accident, which, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, car accidents are pretty crazy. So chances are you're going to get injured regardless. Um, we could have done it the other way. We could have figured out what's the probability that they weren't wearing a seatbelt given that they were injured. And that would be um, the 0.08 divided by, we're still injured, so it would still be divided by the same number. Um, but that's the, the conditional probability um, when we are, even when we're flipping it, you know, we're looking at what's the probability of wearing a seatbelt given that we're injured. So we only have to worry about the people that were injured. So we only like this and this is the whole world at this point. And so we just look at the seatbelt divided by that total. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, equation wise looks kind of like this. Um, so we can switch. So we know a lot of times, you know, the probability of a and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. So we switch now to the probability of A given B, which is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B, which is usually split up to be the probability of B given A plus the probability of B given A complement is usually how this probability of B is written. And that's what Bayes' rule says. Um, that's exactly what we just did. 
we had the 0 .0616 divided by the 0 .0616 plus um, the 0 .08 whatever. Um, we will be practicing this because it's kind of a, a tricky thing. Um, so what can go wrong? Um, don't use the simple probability rules unless it's appropriate. The um, the disjoint addition rule and the um, the one for the independence where we multiply them. Make sure that that actually works. Otherwise, make sure you use the general rules. Um, don't find probabilities for samples drawn without replacement as if they'd been drawn with replacement. So that's make sure that you're using that conditional probability. Um, don't reverse the conditioning naively. Um, that's what we just did is we reverse the conditioning and notice it wasn't just flipping the things around. Like the probability of A given B and the probability of B given A are not the same thing. Um, don't confuse disjoint with independent. Once again, don't be that guy. Um, so the probability rules from the special or from the previous chapter are just special cases for when we have a, a pretty simple system. Um, the general one, we add them, but then we have to subtract the overlap. The general multiplication rule, it's the probability of the first one times the conditional probability, not just probability of B, but the probability of B given that A already happened. Um, and uh, reversing the conditions um, can can be very surprising. Um, I know a lot of times I make up numbers for a drug test and we find out that the probability of being on drugs um, given that you tested positive is not as high as one might think. Um, and then, you know, people always look, it's like, well, but, you know, we're in AP statistics. We're smart enough to either not take drugs or not get caught. Um, and so then I'm like, all right, well, we'll do another example using a pregnancy test. And that usually causes people to blush a little bit more than I anticipate. Um, and it's usually the guys that are really like cringing. Um, and so what else? We have also know that conditional probabilities and reversing conditions can give surprise. Yeah, we just saw that. Um, and that's that Bayes rule. That's that last thing that we did with the tree. Again, don't use this equation, use the tree. The tree is way easier because you generally don't know these values by themselves. Um, think clearly about independence use conditional probabilities um, you can determine if they're independent or not but that way um, they're independent if the probability of b given a is the same as the probability of b which means that a the fact that a happened does not affect that probability um, and then once again if they're mutually exclusive, they cannot be independent. Don't get those mixed up. Don't be that guy. Um, Venn diagrams, tables, and tree diagrams help organize our thinking about probabilities so, so, so very much. They are so helpful um, to organize different probabilities in so many cases. Um, draw a picture, one of them. Make sure you draw a picture and the one you draw depends on the type of situation you're dealing with. Um, and so, yes, independence will be very important throughout the rest of the course. And finally, some AP tips. Um, read the conditional probabilities carefully. Is it A given B? Is it B given A? Is there a complement in there somewhere? Uh, make sure that you're looking at those good. Um, a lot of AP problems use data for probability, um, and a lot of times they're from tables. Uh, they like having tables because you have to pull the probabilities out of it. It shows one extra thing. Um, and checking independence in a two-way table is crucial. Um, checking independence in general is huge. Um, on, the, on the free response problems, um, both the probability ones 
and the last three, which are um, which are the uh, inference problems, um, there's almost always some sort of point for checking for independence of a sample. Um, so checking for independence in general is very, very, very important. Um, so uh, with that, I will see you in class. But until then, keep working problems, keep asking questions, and as always, happy mathing.